That I can Talk understand. Through in the attic. Hmm? That I can understand. <laughs> yeah. uh, hi, my name is Corey Kavanagh. I'm a sixth year student in the Cork Life Centre. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the final event of our uh, Edmund Rice Week, uh, which is uh, very special because it's uh, celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Cork Life Centre, which is, of course, beloved to all of us. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And in particular, I'd like to thank our special guests, Professor Ursula Kukeli, Professor Connor Romani, Dr. Niall Muldoon, and Tanya Ward. And obviously, I'd like to thank Donald Leary and Rachel Lucy for being here too. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about children's rights. First, each of our guests will share some thoughts and insights, and then we will open a panel discussion. Uh, everyone can send in questions or comments into the, uh, the chat throughout the event, and we, uh, we all encourage you. We all encourage you to do so. And uh, before we start, I'd like to invite Don to say a couple of words. Well, that's kind of loaded, isn't it? A couple of words, all right. Um, look, or I, as I suppose, many as you'd like, Don. Thanks very much, Corey. Um, I suppose something I have to touch in first because it would seem strange if I didn't. Um, as people may have seen, um, on, in the media and in on radio, heard on radio, um, we got, uh, I suppose, sustainability into the future as the Cork Life Centre um, after 20 years of trying. Um, it's great to get it. Um, it, it. It does mean that we don't have to worry about where the money is coming from each year. And uh, if we leave Rachel and myself, Thomas and Craig, some time to spend with young people rather than me knocking at doors and looking for money. Um, we're grateful for that. Um, I suppose one of the, the things I'm, I'm, I'm most delighted with is uh, the Department of Education finally acknowledging that the, the young people in the Cork Life Centre um, are entitled to parity of esteem with, their, with, with young people in education. And the other thing to recognize the work of the staff here by, by saying that it, it, is, um, it is a working service, a good service, and it is actually taking young people to where they need to be. First time they've ever admitted that um, and have it written down. Um, the other thing that makes me really happy on this is that, and excited, I suppose, in a way, um, because when we made our submission to them, I didn't put it in because I was terrified it would run them away. Uh, and that is that they're not going to look at sitting with us, looking at how um, we could maybe roll out uh, alternative education using some of ours. Now, that to me is, is a big step forward. My suspicion is it will be slow, 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 slow. But at least it, it's there. It, it's written down. Uh, and yeah, and it's a great time to receive that. I suppose it's tinged with a bit of sadness that Gary O'Shea, who started the centre, is, isn't is here with us to um, take the kudos. Um, but no doubt that the staff here will, will, will push this forward as well. Um, we won't be found wanting and trying to get life centres in every village <laughs> in Ireland. Um, and that's important. Now, to return to the events, I suppose, you know, this this conference, the week of conference, um, is, is all about children. And it's all about children's rights. And I suppose, you know, our government sometimes have to be reminded, and so do our, 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 our people in, in high places, I'm not talking about the four panelists in front of me, no mind you, need to be reminded that rights are rights. They're for children. It's not at the behest of an adult to say whether they're getting the rights or not. They're theirs. Um, and I suppose, you know, when we were laying out uh, the, this final uh, event, it was looking at, you know, how far have we come in the last 20 years? Uh, and then 
how can we approve things going to the next 20? Because I think, you know, for me, and I, this is just me, um, unless we get UNCR, UNCRC um, embedded in Irish law, there is always going to be a regal room for the state to do as little as possible. Um, I think that's, that's, you know, the question all of you faced, I know, in, in where you work and how to get them to move. But I, I, I'd be hopeful that we can do that. And the other thing is recognizing uh, that young people can advocate on their own behalf if given the tools, if given the space, uh, and if given the proper listen to. Uh, not to say that, oh, they don't understand what's happening. Uh, young people understand really well what's happening. Uh, uh, and they're the ones that have the, ex the expertise of how it impacts on them. Um, and so that's something going forward. And that's something we, we want to do here, um, have young people there. Some of the young people are, are in the art room downstairs doing graphic harvesting. Uh, all this week, our cheers have been students of the center. Um, and that's as it should be, you know, the, the next stage for me would be, and they do that anyway, is to have them on as panelists. Um, and they bring a significant amount of experience that as adults, we don't have. So I'm delighted everyone is here. I suppose what, what when I look at the panelists today and all the week, yes, they are experts in their own field, but they're friends uh, of the centre and they're friends of ours. Uh, and I think for our 20th anniversary, it's great that that's the way it is. Uh, and I'm so delighted to have everyone on the panel that's here. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Uh, we're now going to begin our conversation. Uh, our discussion will be guided by a question. And that question is, what have we achieved in children's rights in the last 20 years and what needs to be achieved in the next 20? First, I'd like to invite Professor Ursula Kilkelly to share her thoughts on the question. Thanks, uh, Corey, and uh, afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here and I'm delighted to be included, um, especially be named as a friend of Gorg Life Centre. Um, it's, as everyone will say, it's a privilege to work with you all, to, to support you in any way we can, and uh, to hold you up as we do internationally for a model um, for how you um, engage with and, and, uh, and speak and, and talk the language of, of children's rights um, as a matter of, of practice and day-to-day -day, um, relationships. Um, the the question um, is very timely because I've been fortunate enough over the last while to be doing a bit of thinking, a bit of reflecting on why an, an Ireland has got to where it is from a children's rights perspective. And I, I don't want to uh, steal everybody else's thunder by going first, but it's clear that there have been very significant changes made in, in, um, in Ireland, uh, in particularly in law and policy terms that have really enabled us in many respects to transform the landscape from a children's rights perspective. It's, I think, one of the benefits of being a bit older, you get to see things in, from, from a long term view. Um, and certainly when we look back at where we were when we ratified the convention, um, we have come a long way. Um, and, and, you know, I think we could all talk about the Constitution Amendment, the establishment of the Ombudsman's Office, the National Children's Strategy, the first one um, in particular, uh, the establishment of TUSLA, you know, the National Strategy on the Participation of Children. These are all very significant developments um, that have been, uh, have come about as a result of, of our engagement with our in, with our. Uh, civil society partners, obviously, but also through the influence of international bodies like the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And it is definitely an element of our approach that we listen to and care what people say internationally about us. And, and you in Cork Life Centre more than anyone understand the ability to leverage those international relationships. But one of the ones, one of the, um, what, I suppose my, my um, 
my example of what we've achieved in the last 20 years is actually something a little bit more mundane and probably a bit more marginal for some although I think not for you, and that is that we are celebrating in July 20 years of the Children Act. Um, and when the Children Act was enacted in 2001, uh, we had a very different landscape from a youth justice perspective, and I think particularly in the context of youth detention. Uh, we had significant numbers of children in St. Patrick's Institution, uh, heavily criticised nationally and internationally, and we had a, 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 an average, um, at best, model of care for children in detention. Through the enactment of the Act and a whole raft of measures that took place with um, the department being set up, the Department of Children, the Youth Justice Service being established, um, a whole range of strategy and administrative measures being adopted, money being invested and leadership um, taking hold of the thing. Um, we created, um, obviously, the, the Oberstan Children's Detention Campus as a model of child rights-based uh, care for children deprived of liberty. And we managed through that time to close St. Patrick's Institution. And just having written the book about it, this is um, quite the story um, in international terms. And I think it stands out as one of those things, one of those achievements that we really um, should be proud of. It's a measure of what we can do if we decide um, that we want something better for our children. So that's my that's my one example. Um, my my next 20, again, I could, could all, I'm sure we will spend all, all evening talking about this. You've actually stolen my plunder, Don, because in my view, incorporation of the Children's Rights Convention has got to be the goal for the next 20 years. We may achieve it in less than that, but it is for me, and again, having studied this internationally a lot over the last couple of years, embedding the convention in Irish law and policy will set us on a direction um, where, where we will embed um, the, the, um, the rights of children into our decision-making, into, um, into our lawmaking, uh, into practice at all levels. It really, through our research, can be held up as a direct relationship between the law and children's experience of their rights in practice. Um, one other thing I would just say related to that, and again, it's an area where I think we could hold ourselves up internationally, and that is the, the second that's the point I would make about the next 20 years, is really looking to properly embed um, uh, the voice of young people, participation of young people in decision making. We have to make it inconceivable that we will take the decisions that matter uh, without, without children being involved. Um, and I think we have lots of examples of how we've been able to do that. You stand as, as, a, as a brilliant example of it. But I think, again, in lots of different ways, we need to we need to make this a reality for children and young people at all stages, in all in all decisions, in all matters that impact on them. So they're my uh, they're my two challenges for the next 20 years. Thanks, Corey. Thank you very much. Um... I'd just uh, quickly like to remind everyone that they can send in questions for the panelists through the Q&A function. And uh, you can just send them in throughout the show. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Professor Conor Romani and uh, I'd invite him to share his thoughts on the question. Thanks, Corey. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have to say, I got an email last night at about nine o'clock from Rachel just to let me know about your funding news that the Life Centre just got. Uh, and I have to say, it was the best news I've got in, in quite some time, really brought a smile to my face. Uh, I often think that somebody like me doing what I do for a living, I, I talk about children's rights, I talk the talk about it, but the Life Centre walks the walk. Uh, and it does that every day. And so it's it's really fantastic to see that that's going to go on into the future and then hopefully do so on a, on a wider basis. Um, the question of the last 20 years and, and where we've got to and, and where we go next, 
Uh, it's an interesting one. I, I, I approach it really by putting myself back in, in my own shoes in 2001. You know, what did things look like then? What was I doing in, in, in the field? And at the time, I was just starting a, a master's thesis on the right to education, which Ursula was supervising actually at the time. Uh, and it was at the time, I suppose, fair to say that children's rights was a bit of a niche pursuit in Ireland among a, a fairly small number of kind of committed idealists. Uh, but it wasn't a mainstream concept, I don't think, in 2001. Uh, but if we look at where we've gotten to over the past 20 years, uh, I think it has come much more into the mainstream. Uh, and it isn't the case now that children's rights is only something that a, a small number of people who have a particular interest in it as a, an academic topic or a field of, of activism, uh, that they're focused on it. You know, you do now see the concept of the rights of children and young people uh, being spoken about in the places that matter. Uh, they've filtered their way into uh, the work of politicians. They've filtered their way into the, the legal system and the way that things are designed and set up. Uh, and people in society are, have a much higher consciousness now that children aren't just objects. They aren't possessions of their parents, that children are human beings who have rights uh, and agency in the same way uh, as adults had, well, in, 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 when I say the same way, of course, children are different to adults. Of course, we need to make allowances for the differences between children and adults, but that doesn't mean that they don't have rights. So that doesn't mean that they don't have any uh, independent uh, agency of their own. So I think that has changed. Uh, now I'll come back to where we need to, to get it in terms of changing it more. But to me, that's the, the biggest thing that has changed is that we no longer uh, view children's rights as, as this kind of curiosity that most people don't think about. It has become uh, a much more mainstream concept and an awful lot more people do think about it. Now, the evidence around that, I mean, as Ursula mentioned, we could list a lot of different ways in which uh, we have tried to put some shape on that. Uh, and so if you look at some of the, the developments over that time, uh, the establishment of the Office of the Ombudsman for Children in 2004, which I'm sure Niall will, will speak more about that, uh, the establishment of the Special Rapporteur on Child Protection, the role which I currently hold in 2006, uh, the National Review Panel, which was set up in 2010 to look at where things go wrong for children, particularly in the care system, uh, the establishment of a dedicated Minister for Children in 2011, constitutional amendment on children in 2012, uh, the Ch Child and Family Agency being established in 2013, mandatory reporting in 2015, uh, and most recently, I think for me, one of the, the really str strong developments in recent years would be the establishment of the, the Barna House One House project in 2019, uh, which I think is a real uh, example of Ireland embracing international best practice that where children experience uh, sexual abuse, uh, that in meeting their needs through the investigative and therapeutic process, that you do that using this, this one-stop shop rather than dragging them around to lots of different places where they are interviewed repeatedly and, and perhaps traumatized by that experience, uh, that you now have one single child-friendly uh, environment where you can deal with all of the different things that, that, that need to be provided for somebody who has had that experience. Um, so that project is now up and running in Galway and is currently under development in, in Cork and Dublin as well. Um, so those are all examples of uh, the Irish state, as it were, taking children's rights seriously uh, and putting in place various measures and mechanisms which are designed specifically to protect and cater for children's rights. And so all of that is, is, is really important uh, and there's a lot of really positive uh, stuff there. Uh, but when we look at then where do we need to go next, uh, I mean, over those 20 years, yes, things have improved from a children's rights perspective and the direction of travel is good. Uh, but in other ways, that period of 20 years has been a period where we could have gotten so much further, but I think we've been thrown off track a little bit. Uh, at various points and thrown off track in particular by the two big global shocks during that period of time. The financial crisis of 2008 uh, and the austerity measures which followed on from that uh, and now more recently the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so when both of those things happened, I guess when you have a crisis like that, what it does is it shines a light on where the cracks are in the system already. Uh, and so where you have weaknesses and where you have groups in society who maybe aren't being properly catered for already, uh, they're often the groups who suffer the most when you have a crisis with, like, the, the, as I said, the austerity following 2008 or like what's happened during COVID-19. Um, and 
so certainly COVID-19, I think if we look at the impact of, of the pandemic on children, it's been really, really uh, disastrous in many ways. And the multiple ways in which children have been impacted uh, are most obviously in the educational context, but also in terms of the economic impact, uh, the impact on their, their social life, on their de development, uh, the impact on their health in, in many cases. Uh, and then the, the really negative impacts from a, a child protection point of view in terms of the, the, the harm that many children have been exposed to during the pandemic. Uh, and when push came to shove, I mean, the reality is throughout the pandemic, there have been occasions where certain things were maybe inevitable that the nature of a pandemic and the nature of lockdown was that it was going to cause harm. Uh, but there was some harm uh, and particularly some of the harm experienced by children, which perhaps could have been avoided and could have been mitigated more effectively. Uh, and there were occasions where children could have been more of a priority uh, in how the state responded to COVID-19. Uh, and the reality was that choices were made, uh, which didn't always prioritize the needs of children and young people. Uh, and so that speaks to something around how far we've come and how far yet we still have to go, uh, that we might speak about children's rights, we might speak about making them a priority, uh, but how much of a priority are they really when push comes to shove and when hard choices have to be made? So I think that's one of the things we need to face up to. Uh, related to that is the fact that it, it's one thing to speak about it, it's one thing maybe to pass a law or to establish a new institution or agency, uh, but there's an, uh, an element of follow through on that. Niall and I yesterday participated in a very interesting event around uh, the right to education for children with special educational needs. And a big theme of that was that while uh, we have enacted all these different laws in that area in recent years, we haven't resourced them. We haven't put the resources in place to make those frameworks effective. And so many of the problems in that space that were there 20 years ago are still there. Um, equally, if we look at something like the establishment of TUSLA, yes, it's a good thing that we have a standalone dedicated agency devoted to the protection of children, but we don't resource them in a way that allows them to do their job effectively. Um, so that issue of follow through, that issue of saying that it's one thing to, to, to write a document, to write a report or a policy, uh, even enact a law, but the harder part of following through on that and the harder part of saying, if we have to make a hard choice between do we put resources into this or into that, and if it's a choice between resourcing uh, something to do with children rather than resourcing something that's going to get more votes, quite frankly, uh, at the next election. Uh, we haven't yet got to the point where we always go for the choice um, that, that, that puts children in the position of priority. So that is one of, the, one of the things I would really like to see would be that we get beyond words uh, and we match those words with more action. Uh, and that if we say the children's rights are a priority, that we really follow through as a society on making them, um, them a priority. Uh, and that has to happen, yes, at a political level, but ultimately politicians do what people demand of them. Um, so when it comes to the next election and, and in the follow on from COVID-19, there's going to be a hangover. It's going to be a long hangover and it's going to be an unpleasant hangover. And there's a lot of damage that needs to be undone across society in all sectors. Um, so how do we ensure that children are, are in the queue for what needs to be done to undo that damage? Well, uh, we need to make sure, first of all, we need to work harder than ever in advocating at a political level to ensure that that happens. Uh, but more generally, we need to advocate at a societal level to make sure that everybody in society subscribes to that idea. Because if they don't, we're going to have another general election where there'll be a lot of talk about tax cuts, there'll be a lot of talk about uh, all sorts of issues affecting adults, essentially. Um, but the issues that are of critical importance to children and young people uh, risk being left behind. So we need to get everybody on board uh, with that project to say, yes, we've made progress in 20 years, but we're at a critical juncture where we risk losing a lot of that. Uh, so we need to double down on that effort uh, and, and, and go harder than ever to, to make that happen into the future. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just once again like to say that uh, you can send in questions to uh, the Q&A option for uh, a specific panelist or for just anybody. And uh, next, I'd like to uh, reintroduce and welcome Dr. Niall Muldoon, the Ombudsman for Children, to hear his opinion on the question. Thank you very much, Corey. Um, 
first of all, let's thank you for the opportunity. I thought we'd lost this opportunity to have a panel when we cancelled this time last year. Um, so delighted to get a run at it again. Um, and also congratulations on, on the, at long last, the Department of Education coming to their senses and, and providing proper structure and funding for yourselves and, and hopefully into the future. Um, I suppose what I, what I want to do before we start is maybe have a bit of fun. I took a look back in the year um, 20 years ago to see what was happening. Um, this was the year we just we'd managed to come through the, the millennium bug, different type of pandemic that we were all fearing back then. We got through that. We were still uh, paying for things in the Irish punt. We had we had penny and halfpenny coins. So we're going back a while, lads. There's lots of young people here who don't know what I'm talking about. Halfpenny coins. Um, we also had uh, good things happening. The, the Good Friday Agreement was two years old, but it was only at this stage, I probably think it was the 6th of May, this stage that the provisional IRA started um, decommissioning properly. And then the devolution, the storm and started in May of this year, 20 years ago. So a lot of things have, have happened. Um, and I suppose one of the good things, the funny things I wanted to put out to you too was when we thought we were very civilized and made progress into the next millennium, um, the best selling song of that year was uh, Bob the Builder, Yes We Can. I think that's possibly your motto, Don, is it? <laughs> you know, probably was the, <laughs> the only way you could work was Yes We Can. Um, and then to move on to the question that's, that's before us, I suppose Ursula and, and, and uh, Connor really laid it out. But I mean, I, I just went with a list of what I think are important government led changes because I think it's as Connor says, it's a, it's a government that really that highlights things and makes difference. And, and then the, the, the people have to start rowing in behind it. So, I mean, the establishment of the Ombudsman for Children's Office came because people like the Children's Rights Alliance, Bernardo's, UNCRC forced the hand to create an Ombudsman for Children's Office 2002 Act and 2004, the establishment Department of Children 2011. 2012, the Ombudsman for Children's Office got remit into St. Patrick's Institution. And again, that allowed more pressure to be put on the government to change it, to take children out of, out of uh, adult prisons. It was only 2017 that we got the last child out of an adult prison. I mean, we think we're a civilized society and we're saying it's only four years ago we were taking children out of adult prisons. You know, I mean, we have a long way to go on children's rights. The children's constitutional referendum was hugely important in 2012, but it still was 2015 before we got it into, into being as well. So it's that idea of you keep pushing and pushing. Um, children into direct provision came into the remit of our office in 2017. So for 17 years, they hadn't been able to make complaints to us. And we've been able to push with that, with that remit being clarified, we've been able to push the, the voices of children and also other areas that we did with investigations. One of the other things I think is important and hopefully, again, this is political change, the Department of Children, uh, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth can be a hugely important step forward if we if it's used in the right way but again it speaks to what connor's saying there about the momentum and the the way people need to see it we all we all around this panel here know how much we had to fight to keep the department of children you know i mean that's how it can go like that in the space of three weeks four weeks program for government what's important what's not important we could have lost the department for children the whole essence here is we keep children to the forefront of, of government as often as possible, as much as possible. And that's just something to keep in mind that we, you know, we're the, I think we're the first country in Europe to keep it Minister for Children over three governments. That's really important and we've got to keep that to the fore. Um, so there has been progress, but lots more to be done. Uh, I, I decided to be uh, greenfield and really optimistic and list a few things here that I want over the next 20 years. Um, first thing is the incorporation of the UNCRC, as Ursula pointed out, and I think we may have more opportunity with that, seeing as Scotland have started the ball rolling. They, they incorporated last, last month, so we will really have real examples from there, and you know, uh, hopefully that'll be something we will see, because I do think that's what drills down. That's what means that every area of life will be leading to children and asking the question, what is the best interest of our child, and we can then sue I hate, we hate the thought of having to go into litigation, but it will be built into the, to the systems in a much better way if incorporated. Again, very optimistic. Can we end homelessness in 10 years? You know, can we, we're hoping to eliminate direct provision in a way over the next five years. Um, 
this is the simplest one, and it's it, again, it speaks to how far apart, how far away we are from really putting children to the centre of our, our thinking from a system. Can we establish a twenty four seven social work and mental health system for children? I mean, we're every time I go to Europe, we're a laughing stock when we say we don't have that system in place at the moment. You know, that doesn't take an awful lot of work. There's there may be reasons why it hasn't happened, but it's 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 just beyond uh, incredulous that we don't have it. And then I want to spend a little bit more time maybe with the education system. I think the education system over the next 10, 20 years can change enormously and should change enormously. And I think the pandemic has highlighted the importance of education for more than academia. The importance to children of being involved in, in education, being in schools, the life that it gives them, the, the, the f function that it has is about friendships, relationships, love, hate, breakups, uh, growing into adulthood, being respected by your peers, all those things that come with education. And again, that's part, part of Article 29 of the UNCRC. And this is the piece that I always think the Department of Education forget about. They provide education in a, non, in a non discriminatory manner, and they think that's enough. But Article 29 talks about providing a child or a young person's education to help their mind, body, and talents to be the best they can be. And that's the piece that I think we need to change our education system to provide, to offer to children. And I looked at some of the stats again, um, from the 2013 intake into secondary school, there was 59,500 children. At the junior cert stage, 1,473 of those children didn't take part in the junior cert. So that's 2% were lost. Another 963 did not come back after the junior cert. And from sixth year, 2,167, were lost again. So a total of 5,259 for the start of secondary school in 2013 did not finish. That's 9%. And that's the group that you work in. That's the group that Cork Life Centre deal with. It's those areas children. We can look at, and I think what happens is numbers get lost. And we're, I've heard on numerous occasions the Department of Education and representatives of education saying, we've done a fantastic job because we have 92% of our children go through leave insert. But there's eight or nine percent of our children who can do better, who can perform better and can get their talents enhanced and be allowed to be part of society in a way that they haven't been up to now. And I think that's what the Cork Life Centre and the alternative education system allows. It takes you away from just the points and careers. It, one of the things that I, and my hobby, I, I'm, I do a bit of sports psychology and there's a, uh, a professor, Carl Dweck, who does a thing called growth mindset. Um, it's, and she has a quote that I often highlight. It's, it says, test scores and measures of achievement tell you where a student is, but they don't tell you where a student could end up. And I think that's what we're talking about here. We're giving people an opportunity to see where can I end up here? I can get X number of points, but that doesn't mean anything unless I know where I'm going and where I want to be. And I can only figure that out if I know who I am. And the education system has to really allow that. And the Cork Life Centre does that. It provides opportunity and it's part of the rights of all children to get that. Um, and it, another example, again, of, of, the, of the education system not being child-centered. I had to write a, a, a letter recently to the Minister for Education asking them, could they possibly write a junior cert exam for children in alternative education who wanted to do the exam even though it was canceled? And you think, Department of Education should be jumping up in joy if children actually ask and beg to have an exam done as opposed to, you know, usually they're looking to cancel exams. And we thought, no, that can't be done because that's not the way the system is set up. We don't want to do it because we plan something else. That's not the child at the center of our system. So we need to find ways to, to make that flexibility built in for the group of children we're talking about where the junior cert could be the pinnacle of their career, but it also could be this, the kickstart that says, okay, you know what, I did okay in that. I might go on to the leave insert. And that changes who I am and that changes the path for my life. But yet, for the 50, 60, 70, 80 kids, that's not going to happen this year because a decision was made somewhere down in that loan that doesn't fit. Um, and again, it's just another example. Uh, recent uh, Oireachtas Committee on Education, uh, Deputy Aon O'Reardon, you know, put it out there that it's um, he classed the arrangement that we have at the moment in education as a state funded system, but not a state system. And again, that really highlights that idea that. There's so many aspects. There's an integrated relationship between the state, the patrons, the boards of management, the principals, the teachers, 
before you even get near the student. And that's not the way, again, an education system should be run. There should be a much clearer line that the, the system is set up to serve the children. It's not set up that way. Um, so again, for me, in the next 20 years, I would love to see the children of the children who are coming out of Cork Life Centre now being able to enter an education system that really promotes their talents and their capabilities and their potential, regardless of the scores. Um, so I'll leave it at that and look forward to the conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, Tanya Ward, the Chief Executive of the Children's Rights Alliance. Great. Thank, thanks, Corey. And thanks, Don, and the team at the Life Centre for the chance to take part in, in, in this event. It's great to hear Niall and Ursula and, and Connor. Um, and look, and I want to pay a big tribute to Don and his team for the amazing work that you've done. It's great recognition from the Taoiseach and from the government uh, that, you know, you will be put on the map as an alternative education provider. And, you know, I'm always struck by these great professionals, these great practitioners, these great educationists. Um, and Don and his team really are part of that profession that changed children's lives change children's lives who've been failed by someone along the road. Uh, and I consistently see that. So it's brilliant to see that the Life Centre is going to be able to continue to do that on into the future. So 20 years ago, I was just out of UCC, not long out of UCC, um, a place that I miss. And I was at the beginning of my work in life. Um, and I was doing a piece of work for the Department of Education, looking at the education needs of uh, children, uh, refugee children, unaccompanied refugee children. And I start with it because it's my first exposure, real exposure to um, uh, children's rights abuses that were very clear to me. And of course, I realise now that I've seen children's rights abuses all along my life. But it was at that point I, I really saw it. And I had to go off to a hostel. And this hostel was accommodating children in, uh, in Fibsborough. And it was run by a receptionist, a woman called Linda, a very nice woman. Um, and the social workers told me they sent the children there because Linda was very nice. Uh, and when I was there, it was during the day, uh, I met a 12 year old girl and she was there because she had two younger siblings and couldn't go to school. And she was there because she had to look after them. And I asked Linda, why was she not in school? And she explained why. And I asked Linda, are you, are you, do you have a care background yourself? No, 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 I, I, I work in catering. I was like, oh, oh, all right, okay. And um, so is there anyone here with a care background? No, no, nobody. And there was about 20 children living like this in this hostel in Vibsra. Uh, and it was shocking to me, profoundly shocking that this is happening in our country. And many of you will know that because of the care system that had been set up for refugee children at that time, and accompanied refugee children, many actually disappeared and were trafficked out of the country. Now, obviously, extraordinary things have happened in Ireland for children and uh, in terms of children's rights. And that's really been covered by Ursula and Niall and Connor. You know, we have this really strong infrastructure, essentially, that's in place. We have an ombudsman, we have a minister, we have a department, we have TUSLA, um, we have a court and log, um, and we've seen lots of examples where very serious human rights issues have been addressed. As, as Ursula said, like the closure of St. Pat's, um, the situation for refugee children did change. Eventually, we had equality for children in, in the care system. But unfortunately, it took interventions from the Ombudsman for Children um, and from the Ryan Commission to actually end that. Um, so where, what's happened from a positive point of view? Well, one or two of the things I've seen, I thought would be worth mentioning that I think is, is really significant, uh, is the marriage equality referendum actually. Because it was an example where young people themselves actually took part in that referendum. They actively helped get the vote out. Um, they actively used pe pester power. <laughs> they used all their tools to be able to get that vote out and get that positive result. And that has had a profound effect on lots of uh, young people throughout the country, particularly LGBTI young people, they now feel like they belong. There's obviously lots of other stuff that we need to address, but it just shows you when you mobilize young people and when they get to play a role in the big human rights issues, they can change what happens on the national agenda. Another thing that I saw, which really affected me uh, was just seeing the power of young people involved in the consultation around Brexit actually. Uh, they came up with lots of stuff that none of us had come up with. 
Um, and it really had a big effect on the Minister for Children and her department. And I remember after that consultation, these young people from Northern Ireland were from Ireland. Uh, the Minister actually went off to a cabinet meeting in Westport in Mayo. And everything they talked about actually landed on the government agenda. And Catherine Zapone was like squarely central to what the government decided to do on Brexit. And it really shows us that if you give young people their chance, if you actually listen to their views and you honestly listen to them, they can have a profound effect on the decisions that we make as a country. So where do we go next? I mean, I think everyone has named it. The, the incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is the starting point. It's the next big turning point. It's going to have the revolution that we need to see. Um, and it will make things look very different. Um, if you even just take what happens at the rec at the, in relation to the COVID lockdown, no doubt the department and, and the government decided that, yes, we try and keep schools open, we'll try and prioritise schools over other areas of society and businesses, etc. Um, but it was very clear to see that children were not central to the decision making around ed decisions in education. So it's a key service for children and young people. Um, uh, but decisions are made around the table and there are 17 partners and only one represent children and young people at that table. If we had a children's rights based approach, that wouldn't be the approach that wouldn't be acceptable. Um, and that's one of the things we need to push for. I, I met with an organisation today, New Directions. And they, they work with um, uh, uh, families who've had uh, a partner who's been imprisoned. And they were just talking about the trauma that children experience when that actually happens, when a parent, as mostly a father, is imprisoned. And the trauma of having to go into a prison and the experience of it, going through security, and then they're meant to have a nor they're meant to try and have normal family life with their with their father, and yet they're stuck in a sterile room. And there's no attempt to actually childproof it, make it a space. And in lots of other countries, the attempts would be made to do that uh, would be a space where children can feel safe and where they can have a normal family life with, with their father. And if we had a children's rights based approach and if decision makers, the service providers of prisons were obliged to think about what's best for children and listen to their voice, we wouldn't have those kind of situations emerge. I suppose one of the things that strikes me as a children's rights campaigner and you, you never feel like your job is done you never do you you, you, you you win one battle and then there's 10 other battles left um, and one of the things that really strikes me at this point in, in time in our society we're actually at a low point after covid i mean uh, connor has said it uh we've got major issues with school dropout, high levels of anxiety uh, and mental health, poor mental health among children and young people. We have interfered with the course of their lives. It will have profound effects for many years to come. But the thing that I suppose keeps me awake at night is all the different children's rights abuses I still see on, on, on a daily basis. You know, the children who can't get a school place in September. I mean, there's quite a few every year. The children that are stuck doing home tuition because they couldn't actually get a school place because the schools are not resourced. I mean, it's completely unacceptable in a country that prides itself on, on its education system. Um, the fact that when you look at traveller children whose lives have not really improved, if you look over the last 20 years, I met with the Irish uh, traveller movement very recently and they were talking about, you know, children who were living and on the side of the road where there's no sanitation, no running water. And they were talking about, you know, a teenage girl uh, getting her period. And, and it's normal for most families, but it's actually a crisis for a family living in those conditions because they've no sanitation, they've no running water. The girl is ashamed. She's ashamed she's caused all this stress for her family. And it strikes me, how is this possible in a country like 20, in 2021 that we still have children? where their basic needs and their fundamental needs are still not being met. And I think that's one of the places we need to start when we look at the next 20 years. I'll be near retirement, hopefully, if we make it that long. Um, and it's one of the things I'd like to see, all the big things that we've managed to change, uh, the, you know, the imprisonment of children in adult prisons, um, the inequality in the, the refugee uh, and the childcare system. We, have, we still have lots of big challenges like that that we have to address, and I hope through the next 20 years by incorporating the convention, by really making decisions that, that are really about children and young people, uh, by having the right to vote for children and young people, you know, 16 and 17 year olds, and actually identifying each and every children's rights abuse that we actually have a country where every child has a chance to grow up equally. And we can, I, I'm, 
absolutely believe we can make Ireland one of the best places in the world to be a child or a young person. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to invite Don to say as much as he wants, because apparently he had a problem with a few words last time. <laughs> you know me in a few words. Um, I, I suppose, you know, for me, I, I take a different deck from, from the panelists in some ways. I think, yes, there has been improvements. Um, so Tusla was put forward. Yeah, great that uh, a standalone organization that was going to look after, after children, particularly children that were uh, vulnerable in, in many ways. Um, however, closing the department at half four, when everybody knows that when a household goes into trouble, it's from nine o'clock at night or maybe a bit earlier than that until the following morning. Uh, no cover at weekends, um, no supported lodging for children that, that, that run in. We still have to get the guards if, if, um, if there are things go wrong. So yeah, there have been big changes. I think particularly, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge that, okay, I, I am on the board of Overstown um, and came at that with a very um, skeptical eye, to be honest, in that I, I don't believe that any detention um, is good for children. You do have to have it though. And when you have it, then I should be in there saying something rather than doing nothing. Uh, and I must pay tribute to, because it can be on individuals, but Pat Bergen, who, who took it on at the, the probably the, the worst possible time was director. I, I think the, the changes that stand out to me are that instead of coming from a present officer, they're gone, it's gone to child care. And I think that is a major shift. Uh, and to see people who are genuinely trying to make the lives of children better in that situation uh, is absolutely amazing. Uh, coming from where we were, St. Pat's and Adam. But, but there are lots of areas we have failed in. And if I could just maybe, maybe mention some, uh, we built a courthouse in Cork and we didn't change it to benefit children where they could sit around the table instead of being a judge up, 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 on, up on a podium. Uh, the acoustics are still absolutely terrible uh, and children come out of there not knowing what's been said, what's been done. Um, and I know a couple of legal people here, now, there might be some in, in, in the, in the Q&A as well, but we still have solicitors who go around the courthouse on a Friday morning looking and, and grabbing children and who never take them to an office. Uh, keep getting cases put back um, when, you know, we all understand that children's brains don't work that way. And by the time it comes up, the kids can't even remember what they're in the first place for. All children are arriving in the courthouse at the same time. Um, I, I, and it's like a, a gathering in a meeting place for, for, for you know, it, it can be like a crash down there some days. And all of this could easily be done with a bit of planning. New courthouse, not considered. Children not considered. Why? Um, you look at our, our mental health system, whereby um, you still have to go. There's eight beds in, in the mental health system in, in Cork, eight or nine beds is all that's there for children. Cams are overrun, um, and that's going to get worse. And we know it's going to get worse because, for instance, so as all the children came back to school, there are four and a half thousand didn't get back there. Why? What's going on? We don't acknowledge in children that, particularly primary school children, I think, at the moment, you know, the, 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 the milestones that, that they have missed, you know, communion, confirmation, uh, getting the help they need to move on from a system where you have a mammy daddy figure working with you for three years. You're then saying the secondary school where you're going to meet eight teachers on your first day. Um, and, and for me, the biggest one of all is the lack of planning and if I if I could maybe use this because I, I I firmly believe this and you know grateful to Oberstone again for producing um, stats on this but but it does seem to me that you know 
our, our mental health system is broken. Uh, Cam's, the, the waiting lists are, are too big where we promised and promised they're going to come down. They never do. You have NEPs going into primary, primary schools and they can see two children out of 300 uh, to, to, to try and help them along. And you look at, you look at our, our, our addiction services, which, which are not fit for purpose. Again, so few beds for young people with addiction. You look at our education system with the largest classrooms in, in, in Europe, still 30 kids in a classroom, um, not fit for purpose. Uh, and not, uh, I'm not blaming individuals in these. And so then, when all of these situations are broken, the care system is broken. Um, you know, we have, in many cases, English companies coming in, taking in children into care for profit with the remit that if the child breaks something, the guard's called. And so with that system moving children out of care and into the juvenile justice setting, and it does seem to me Town is looked at as a place, all right, mental health, all of that, send them to Overstone. And we're sending kids uh, along a track of where we're criminalizing them for issues that we need to be dealing with elsewhere. There is no planning. It should be coordinated. You can't have systems breaking down and, and for children, they need to be coordinated, and they're not. And I think for me, that's a, a big thing. It's something that Niall said, you know, in relation to children and the 10% the government talk about. I, I give a bigger one, right? 900,000 children were in primary school and secondary school from the last census of Phillips. 10% of them are going to be deemed. And I, I, I don't like this word because, you know, for me, children cannot fail a system. The system fails them. You know, they can't be blamed for systems breaking. And if you have 10% of 900,000, it's 90,000 kids over a period of what, 15 years. And we're condemning those kids who, for lots of different reasons, are out of education. And it, it could be mental health, it could be addiction, um, it could be didn't fit. You know, we haven't organized that. And I suppose, for me, we need to be dealing with her in that way. And we need to get children involved. Children are very good at telling you what's what's wrong, what's happening to them, and, and, and what's going on for them. But adults tend to hear the noise children make, but seldom listen to them. And I think, you know, sometimes, uh, even still, children's rights are lip service. They're lip service, and they will continue to be lip service until we get, I mean, it was only last year when the government was formed and they've taken away the, 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 uh, the Minister for Children. They were. And, and it was just a massive campaign that, that, that moved that. At the start of the pandemic, children were described in terrible terms in relation to what they were doing. During the pandemic, you know, one of the things that we're always saying is that, you know, we should be trying to keep families together. We should be, you know, when it's safe, but given supports. Uh, supervised access. A judge, a judge had to say that this was essential and they needed to continue. However, in this lockdown, some of the, the some of the centers that, that facilitate access were closed. Social workers were working from home. We have an access center here that was barely used and we, we, we had put it down as essential and we kept it open and we didn't have people coming into it. But we, we couldn't get a response and I, I went to team leaders in Tusla, I, I went to managers in Tusla and said, look, the judge has said this is essential, why, why is it not happening? And, and you know, the response wasn't good enough. Quite honestly, it's, it just wasn't good enough. So, so I think, you know, while, while we have made some progress, that progress is very easily lost if we don't get people to, to back it up. And I think most of the people have said this here, but I do think, you know, unless, unless the systems are working right across the board for children, 
then it's going to fail all the way along the lines and you're going to lose children to education more so you're going to lose children um so yeah i i mean yet yeah, lots of lots of big changes get all of that but fundamentally what's happening on the ground sometimes belies what's happened at, at, at the upper deck and and you know we need to involve children in decisions made about children we we do it sometimes it's just lip service we talk about participation when you look deeply there's pieces missing out of it children aren't involved from the start they're brought in at the end and told what do you think it is and decisions already made so yeah uh, uh, and thanks but I, I i do think the next 20 years we need to see a lot more happen and quickly thanks don uh now we're going to uh have some time for a dis uh, discussion led by questions of those attending and first i have a comment and a question here from someone uh, despite the progress of the last 20 years i feel that children's rights is at present an academic political and narrow pursuit there is a lack of understanding among the wider population about children's rights i still hear the phrase children should be seen and not heard what are your thoughts on how we can encourage the wider population to support and implement children's rights? Open to the whole group. Yeah, I might come in on that one because it's closely connected to some of what I was speaking about. I suppose what I, what I was saying was over the 20 years, I have picked up that there are more people speaking about children's rights than there were 20 years ago. Now, that's not to say that there are enough people thinking or speaking about children's rights. Uh, but I think in interactions with the legal system, with interactions with, with government agencies, there is more of a focus now. And, you know, if you just take the example of, of court decisions, for example, affecting children, the way that judges write those now, there is much more of a focus on children's rights than there used to be. You are much more likely now to hear civil servants in, in discussions around issues, making specific reference to children's rights or, or, or referencing them in government policy. So, that's uh, i guess what i was trying to get across that that you didn't see that 20 years ago you are seeing it now but when we broaden that out to to the population at large uh, it's fair to say that that hasn't taken hold um, as as a, a kind of a ubiquitous thing we do need to see more of that how do we do it is what the question is really asking i think there's a couple of elements to that i think education is very important i think the idea of children's rights education that we start at the at the beginning um, and that we make children aware of their rights as children, those children will then grow up and will help to spread the, the, the message on that. Uh, and then there's a lot to be done in, in terms of the advocacy side of things. I think that those of us who are advocates in this area need to direct our advocacy, not just at the decision makers and not just at the politicians and so on, but also help to, to explain to the population at large why it is that children's rights matter and why they should matter to them personally. Uh, you know, that there are there's longer term benefits to society that, you know, picking up on some of Don's points, if you get things right for children now, you save problems for society at large down the line. And so everybody should have an interest in that. And I think we need to, to explain to people why that's the case. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm go, on, go ahead, Tanya. Is Aisha? Sure? <laughs> Sorry. Like, thanks, Noel. Um, I completely agree with everything Connor has said. And one, one of the things I think we need to, we want to try and change public attitudes, because uh, obviously you start with children and young people, but with the public at large, we need to understand what they hear when they hear the word children's rights. Um, we did a piece of work when we did our No Child 2020 campaign on child poverty, uh, where we did focus groups to see what the public thought when they heard about child poverty and, and of course everyone has been out in the airwaves describing the kind the impact on poverty on children uh, uh and you know so you would think that the public would understand what it means but in fact what the public was hearing and very similar uh to the data results in the uk is when you described the impact on, on child poverty on the child they were immediately thinking bad parents the child is in poverty because they have a bad parent and the parent doesn't know how to uh and, and then when the 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 the, the pollsters probed it what why do you think that oh we think it because they actually don't know how to manage their money that's what it's about they keep on buying takeaways and going and, and taking taxis and what they didn't understand was the systematic nature um of poverty and the impact that the parents have actually no choice they can barely keep 
their heads above water. Um, and I suppose, so how do you change that? When the public thinks that, how do you change that? Well, you have to change your messaging and work out what messaging is actually going to bring the public along with you. Um, and there's lots of examples where that has worked in the past, particularly in relation to housing and homelessness. So the same work that we had done, uh, what was really interesting was the public felt that they actually understood that the housing crisis was because the government made particular decisions. They made the wrong decisions. And that was basically based, based on very sophisticated public messaging work that had been used by the housing charities over a long period of time. So I think we need to spend money, actually, is one of the things. We need to understand what people think and we need to work out what kind of messaging can motivate them and learn how to deliver the message to bring them along with us. Because to be honest, when you talk to the politicians, what they say is you can often get a, a champion and they'll go with, with something you want. But what really motivates them is what they hear on the doorsteps and what people want on the doorstep. So if you want to get the profound change that we all want to see happen, we have to try and impact what people on the doorsteps are saying. And I think that that's one way to go about it. It's it's hard to follow that, Tanya. I suppose the example I would give on that in regards to that is uh, 2017, we celebrated the uh, 25th anniversary of the um, incorporation of the of the or the uh, CRC coming into Ireland uh, being ratified and part of what we did was to try and make people recognize how much they're doing for rights already the general public so we we put a campaign into the GEA where we we showed that every coach is involved in promoting the rights of children by enjoying helping them to enjoy leisure to help them feel safe protecting them all those elements are there every parent is is involved in children's rights in learning how to you know give a good home providing education, teachers are involved in, and sort of bringing it down to the ground level as well. So I think it ties in what Tanya's saying. If we, if we remind people of what they're doing and what children's rights mean in the in your house, you know, one of the things we do when we bring children to our office is we ask them what they do from the time they get up to the time they go to school. You know, are they do they dress themselves? Do they put on a school uniform? Do they talk to their, their sister or brothers? Do they have breakfast together? Do they get travel in with their parents to school? And straight away, the children learn that that's their rights. They have the right to privacy. They have the right to uh, food, warmth, shelter, education. And we start to make that real. And I think that's the sort of conversation. So I think it would tie in with, if you're trying to move it to a groundswell of people on the ground, we need them to understand that every day of the week, they're doing something about children's rights. And every decision they make is about children's rights. And I think those are the sort of things that, that we can start moving on once you've got that money invested as well, as Tanya said, to sort of get the message spot on. I just make make a point from a slightly different perspective because I, I do agree with, with with all of those um elements of the approach and and as a country that's never had a a, a comprehensive campaign uh, on children's rights I think that's a huge gap. Um, we did a study a number of years ago about um, studying studying curriculum at, at third level um, to assess the the extent of children's rights in the in the curriculum. Um, and we found a huge amount of child protection, but not very much children's rights. And I think there is a question there about, as Tanya said, what people hear and what people understand when, when you say certain words and, and, and communication and dialogue. And all of that's hugely important. And one of the things that we found in our international research around incorporation of the convention is that there are um, even through through measures which are not which fall short of full incorporation of fully giving the force of domestic law to the entire convention even where you have measures that are say indirect where you might um, like Wales has done um, put in place a, a requirement that all laws um, those making laws have to have due regard to the convention even in those softer mechanisms you start to sensitize people to what the difference is between uh, children, child protection and children's rights, the entitlements that children have as a matter of right and the responsibility that's on the state to deliver and, and vindicate those rights for children. And you start to shift the thinking and the culture around, um, uh, around children's issues and decision making becomes more uh, in tune with, with the children's rights approach. Um, and there are lots, and, and I mean, the reasons that we all talked about those different measures, the establishment of the Ombudsman and so on, uh, the national strategy, all of those are building blocks to creating the kind of culture and awareness around children's rights that's necessary to sustain incorporation, to sustain much bolder, more ambitious uh, reform around children's rights issues. And um, 
when we did our well the end of this when we did our study in 2012 for UNICEF UK on incorporation um, we divided up the countries we had to visit and I will never um, forget that I, I went to Norway and I went to Belgium and I went to Norway where they had incorporated uh, by by an act of parliament um, and they'd gone through this process of raising awareness and working with the convention to bring it into their national law and it really um, people owned it the social workers the teachers owned the law because they had made it their own as opposed to it being out there and something that, that people um, refer to as an international instrument. Um, and then we had Belgium who, who had incorporated as a matter of, of, of law when they ratified the convention, a different system. And yet they lived and breathed the convention like you, you know, you would certainly us children's rights people would, would only dream. So, so culture and national culture and our relationship with children and our relationship with the states all bound up in all of this. But there are things and there's good, good, I suppose, knowledge and examples and experience out there of how you create the kind of better understanding and culture around children's rights that will support better, better implementation. Um, just just on that, maybe communication, I something about communication, or if I can break it down small, but to, to education. And it's how people understand things. So alternative education is looked at as something less than. And the reason it's looked in less than is that it's outside the system. And what should be happening is that you have an education system that includes alternative education and formal education. And if you can, if you can get it that way, then I think people start looking at it differently. Uh, there, there's no reason to look at it differently if, and so anyone that's in um, alternative education, it's trouble. Try and get a child back into the formal education system if they've been out for a while, mental health or otherwise, and they've come to a setting like ours, it won't happen. And not because of anything the child does, but because in the, in the staff rooms, children coming for, who have been out of formal education for a while are seeing as trouble. And I think, you know, words and the use of words are, are useful. The other thing I would say is that um, Children's Rights Alliance, um, you know, I think they have a big part in playing this. Um, more, more groups should be encouraged into that. Anyone working with, with children, because you then have an umbrella group with 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 lots of ordinary people in that. People that may not even so, some may not know exactly what children's rights are all about, but it starts to permeate down. And, and I, I think the more groups like that that go into organisations like the Children's Rights Alliance. I think the better it will become and the more likelihood you would start a campaign based on that. And, and campaigns can be successful. I mean, 2020, the, 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 the stopping of, of the removal of the Minister for Children. I've no doubt that was, it was the social media, it was in the papers, that had an impact and it looked like there would be major problems if they shifted it or tried to. And it stopped. Thank you very much. Uh, I might start by directing this next question to Dr. Niall Muldoon. When systems don't uphold children's rights, what are the consequences for the breach? Wow. Um, I suppose individually, it's it falls to the parent to, or the advocate or the child themselves to, to look to try and fix the, the problem first off. Um, and if they're not happy, they have the opportunity of coming to ourselves to try and make a complaint. But I suppose what you want to do is get a self-correcting system in place. We want to move to a situation where people are self-reflective, whether that's in housing or education or mental health or therapy, wherever it might be, social works. We need to get a, a start getting a system that starts to improve itself every year. Um, I'm very encouraged by, by the people that are now in charge of Tursla and, and um, HSE even they're starting to to take on board that complaints can be the can be the mechanism by which you improve your system and reduce the complaints later on. Um, so children's rights not being not being upheld within your system should be something you look at as that's a red flag. I need to make sure it doesn't happen again, as opposed to that's a nuisance that I need to get rid of. And I think there's been too many thinking that way within the systems. 
and we need to start looking like in a private business if you're running a restaurant and somebody complains to you the first thing you do is make sure that never happens again so that you don't have to take that hassle in the future so we need to start doing that that self-reflective that self-improving and seeing complaints as a mechanism by which you can make your system better for everybody involved and again that brings you back to is the child the center of your system is the child your customer and if you do that then you will change the system you have to change the system at the moment the child is is the end user of a system that we've already set up for ourselves that works nine to five most of the time and we will do a few little bits of pieces outside of that but the the end user is not the important person the, the system is the important piece um and that's why you don't have crossover between one education and mental health uh, you know why tusla doesn't talk to hse all these elements are separate. So what are the implications for when it goes wrong? I mean, we have a, we can take complaints and we try to fix them. And to be fair, you know, we've maybe 1600 complaints a year. Once we get involved, most of the complaints are settled within eight weeks. 95% of them would be settled fairly quickly once we get involved because people want to fix them for children. They know it has to be done quickly. Local resolution is the quickest, easiest way for us to fix things. Occasionally then they're more complicated. We'll go to an investigation level. Um, and that's that's something we you know we, we don't go to too often and that leads to a publication which can lead to an element of publicity and and uh, that can force change as well so but you want to avoid that I mean again that our investigations could take 18 months to two years but for a child that's a long time you know you don't want to you want to get to a situation where you just make a phone call or you drop a letter and say right that's going to be fixed and that'll be sorted for the future and it won't happen again um, and again, that's where incorporation of UNCRC, that's where children's rights being part of every public servant's job and being part of their DNA is what we want to get to. Um, so the implications for them, there's, there's not an awful lot, you know, um, litigation could be something that comes up ultimately as well. Um, and that's oftentimes you hit people in the pocket, hit the, the government in the pocket, that could be the way to do it. But Sometimes I would suggest they fight dirty and when you go to that situation as well. It's very hard on a parent to do that um, and very expensive, obviously. So, yeah, it's a limited, there's limited ramifications. But again, I'm optimistic that we need to move to a self-correcting system as soon as, you know, over time. Happy to leave it open to anyone else, Corey. If nobody else has anything to add, uh, we can move on to the next question. Uh, we're really concerned about the impact on young people's mental health and well-being post-pandemic in a system where waiting lists were already untenable. What solutions to effective educational and mental health supports for uh, young people? Uh, open to everyone. If I could just quick, I'll just quickly say that was something I've, I've repeated before. Um, I've got the opportunity last week with the education committee to to promote the idea of getting therapists available to every primary school in the country. You know, there wouldn't necessarily be one in every school, but there were one available to every school. So to try and reduce that um, the tensions and the and the, the uh, mental health pressure on uh, primary care, I think from the just it should be the most natural thing in the world. It happens in, in Wales, Scotland, uh, and England, Northern Ireland have it as well. I think it's that concept that children are under so much pressure all the time, just in general life before the pandemic, you know, separations, uh, addictions, blended families, step families, bereavement, children just go through these things. And if they have somebody that's available to them, four or five months of therapy at eight years of age could be the end of the problem. But if it isn't sorted then by 12, 13, 14, it could lead to all sorts of issues. So that early intervention hopefully will be something that will come in um, in the near future. That's just one thing that I'm putting forward. Yeah, to, to add to that, I think one of the things we really need to start thinking about here is the idea of forecasting what people need. Uh, this came up in a, a discussion Niall and I were invited to in the Department of Children some weeks ago, and they were talking about trying to move in that direction. Uh, and we've, you know, huge problems in this area in Ireland. It's been mentioned earlier, Tanya mentioned the idea of people not getting school places. I mean, we have situations where you have 
uh, children with special needs finishing in primary school and there are no secondary school places available. Now, those children have gone all the way through the primary school system. Everybody knows they're going to need a secondary school place at the end of those eight years. And, and for some reason, it hasn't been, been put in place. Uh, so I think there is a, a, an emerging awareness that we need to get better at that. Uh, but I think we need to plug that into the COVID context in a big, big way, because uh, there is a mountain of evidence uh, that's emerging about how COVID has impacted on children across a whole range of different parts of their lives. Uh, so we know that now. So there is no excuse for not forecasting what that means for education, for health, for mental health, for all the different services that children need. We know now where the impacts are. So we need to start planning to put in place the services to meet that need. Can, can, can I just add one, just one thing, a short point, just in relation to it, I completely endorse um, Niall and Connor in, in terms of the interventions that, that we need. But it, it's one thing that strikes me is we, I think we should be looking as well at, you know, what is creating poor mental health and anxiety within, in, in children and young people. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things we saw around COVID was the leaving certificate. And, the, the, you know, it's it, it's 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 unacceptable that I had the same horrible experience during the leaves and search that young people are having today. Um, every time that young people are consulted, they say it's causing them huge levels of stress and anxiety. And yet, 20 years on, there's still no reform of the leaving search. Um, and we, we, I, I think it goes to the heart of the fact that children's rights are not at the heart of our decision making when we look at these issues. So there are the two parts of the mental health question. There's the this intervention and supports we put in place. And we need to look at what are causing poor mental health for children and young people as well. And we need to address those issues as well. Can I just make a, a sort of slightly different point? I completely in, in, endorse all of that. And I suppose in relation to uh, Tanya's point, um, that's sort of an add on is, is to really think about the relationships that are in young people's lives, the strength and support and resilience that children get from those around them should in most cases be sufficient to, to take care of children's needs. And, and so there are there is a, a, a complex picture here. I think we also need uh, to, to distinguish, um, notwithstanding, I think the really important point that Niall made about early intervention, to distinguish between those who have um, have mental health and, and related concerns that need uh, support and, uh, and um, even medical intervention and, and those matters that are that are significant issues of welfare and well-being. And, I also think we just need to be a little bit careful about uh, not being seen to write off a generation of children. This has been a short, shocking period of time and many will suffer, I've no doubt about that. But we know um, that children can and do um, look after and, and, and develop um, in ways when they're supported. Uh, that will continue to, to astonish us. And I think we just need to be listening to them, listening to young people themselves about what they need, um, rather than coming up with, with prescribed um, uh, services and sports, like, like others have said, that, that simply will not meet those needs. I mean, I was struck by um, the piece of work we did on the global study for, for children deprived of liberty, where Nobody had thought that we would ask children about their experience in detention um, and expected that when we did, they would say everything was terrible. But in fact, they found in their own lives lots to be positive about, lots to look forward to, lots to be hopeful about. So we, we I suppose the, the key thing is in the listening. And I was struck, Tanya, when just you were talking about the Leaving Cert, the thing for me about the Leaving Cert was, in addition to all that you've said, who did we prioritize when we brought children back to school? We prioritized the leaving certs. What does that say about the importance of that exam in people's lives? It struck me as has been something whether whether or not it would have been what, what leaving cert students wanted is another is what is one thing. But that sense of what we were prioritizing, even as a society, when we were returning children to school was the exam years. <laughs> I thought, I'm not sure this is the right way around. I, and, and, you know, now you mentioned something, I, I was a colour a while ago, just in relation to junior cert. And, you know, one of the things about the junior cert is that it's it's the minimum requirement 
to go for an apprenticeship. So, you know, if, if you think about years ago, you had a dad that was a plumber or a cousin or an uncle or a friend of a friend, you could go and join them. But now you have to have at least a junior cert. And the interesting thing for me last year was I, I, I did go and I know Tanya made representations in relation to this. And we got onto the department and said, look, it's not going to be enough because it's not a junior cert to give school reports. And they promised that they would put a page to it saying they've completed their, their junior cert uh, site. Brilliant. Um, but to show how the children are not centered to that department ever, which is strange because it's education. Last week, we got that letter for last year. And actually a politician went to the Department of Education because they primed him to, and he was told it was out, every school had it. We did a quick search here with seven different types of education um, placements in the city and, and in Limerick and found that none of them got it. Then we get this letter last week to say, this is how it's going to be done. A full year for, you know, for us here, it was one child was leaving, full year they could do nothing because the minute they went in about the apprenticeship to rest, where's your junior cert? What are your junior cert results? No junior cert results, no move on. And I, I, I think if you look at what the department are prioritizing, I think your skill is right in relation to the leave cert. The department wants to get rid of the junior cert. Now, sound. But how do you, you know, keep that ability to move on and to progress into a trade if that's what you want to do. They haven't discussed that. And I think the department didn't ask children about moving to junior cert. I know our young people here wanted to do it. And it's important for young people who felt they would never succeed, who are never going to, to use a state exam. And it's even more cultural than that because one of the things I've noticed here over the years, and 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 in St. Kevin's before I came to here, was that it's amazing when parents come in and they tell you that that child is the first child in that family to have, to have taken a state examination. And, and I think with the, with the leaving cert, it, it, it's a joke. Um, choices, we were told this year. The Department of Education had a year and didn't even plan A. I'm going to play a plan B, plan C. And what it seemed to be aimed at, and I believe this most sincerely, they tried to corral kids into doing the examination. So they said very little about the predicted grade until the last minute and, and had children absolutely terrified about what was going to happen, particularly after the, the fiasco of last year. And still no, no, nothing done. Um, you know, Colin and Noga said they were meeting with, they were meeting with the teachers' unions. I don't see a children's input into that. And I think uh, until we do, and until, you know, agencies start taking the child-centered approach to areas that are concerning children, the Leaving Cert is not fit for purpose. You know, we don't even prepare in the Leaving Cert young people for going to third level. Think about it in English. <laughs> you're doing your Leaving Cert and your teacher is telling you, use I, I, I when you're doing the, the essay. Um, and go on your own experiences. I'm sure Ursula and Connor would know, and, and the rest would know on the panel that you go into university and you start using an I, and you won't be long getting a nice letter back saying, who made you the expert? I, I mean, it, it is a shock. The other thing is, again, if you look at it, and it, it, you know, proof of, 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 of we're not preparing children to go to third level at any sort of, of way, is that the biggest dropout of third level, whether it be PLCs or whether it be universities, is first year. Because the whole different system and we ain't preparing and the leaving cert doesn't prepare kids for that. Thank you. Uh, this next question is open to everyone again. Uh, really resonates with me regarding the lack of resources for those of us who work in the area to enable us to do our jobs effectively. So my question is, how can we further collaborate together and what actions can we take to tackle this?
I think it, it, it goes back to part of what we were saying earlier on that, I mean, resources ultimately, if organizations that are providing essential services are under-resourced, they're under-resourced because they haven't received the resources they need from government. Uh, and government distributes resources based on political priorities. You know, <clears throat> we're aware every year that the budget will happen and the budget will be where the various ministers will sit around the cabinet table and will haggle over how much money goes to education and how much to health and how much to transport and so on. Um, and those decisions get made, you know, partly based on programs for government, uh, as well as the other things going on at, at a given moment in time. And programs for government emerge from elections, which emerge from, from, from manifestos. So it all just traced back to that, that, that sort of political dynamic about what do people think is important? What are people demanding? What are people looking for? And that's what then determines where, you know, the, the limited pot of resources, which is, of course, limited. Uh, to be fair to governments, there's only a certain amount of resources available at any given point in time, but within that they make choices. Uh, and so if we think back to the, the last general election, I think back to the debates, there was a lot of talk about fiscal space at the time, was a ter term that was going around an awful lot. Uh, health did feature a reasonable amount. Uh, but I was watching carefully and I noted that in the big debates that happened at the time, education didn't come up at all. Uh, child protection didn't come up at all. You know, so some of those, those issues that are central to the discussions we're having now just weren't there. They weren't on the agenda. Um, so you have to ask, why is that? And OK, so part of it might be that the media has a, a stake here, that the media frames those discussions and maybe uh, trying to influence key people in the media to put those issues on the agenda is, is one part of it. Um, but it, it also is connected into what we were saying earlier on about getting the population at large to buy into this. Um, and to kind of say to them, if people are thinking, well, I'd like my tax cut, um, to really get them to think, well, would you like your tax cut more than uh, you would like to see adequate resources put in place to, to meet the needs of, of vulnerable children? And to really get them to reflect on, on that choice and to think about what are they going to, to demand of the people who will ultimately make that decision. Um, so I think that's a, a collective thing that all of us in the sector, everybody in the sector needs to really come together and keep hammering home that message and, and, and get that buy in across the across the society as a whole. I might just say a little bit one uh, little piece on that. I think there there's still within the services we have now. I still think there's a lot of room for improvement, um, sharing resources, cooperating, and wasting energy in the wrong places. You know, I mean, we we did an investigation of Molly with a young girl in foster care um, with severe profound disabilities, and we found social workers were chasing pennies and seats and stuff like this that didn't need to be done. If you if you get the system right. And you put the child at the end or you can predict your your budgets you can predict what you have to do and then the, the social worker can spend their time instead of arguing with their boss as to whether they should pay for a wheelchair or pay for something nappies um they can just say this is going to be paid for and i'll set the time chatting to my to the girl that i'm involved with to molly i'll spend time supporting the, the parent at an emotional level as opposed to trying to get the practical stuff you know those sort of things can still be streamlined if you get the right focus Again, you're putting the child back to the center of the focus. Um, can we take some of the administrative way work off the, the social workers? Can we take it off the, the teachers? Can we provide time for them to be in the moment with their children and with the, with the support that they need to give them? Um, anyone that's dealing with children in a, in a really practical way. So there's, there's probably still stuff to be doing. Connor's talking about the macro level and he's right 100%. The, the government or the, the focus on children has been very minimal in general election areas. But I think we, we need we can still do better in the internal systems. I, I do think as well, though, that, it, you know, and it's probably Connor was kind of alluding to this. Um, I, I, I think, you know, people wait and they make submissions before the budget. But I think, you know, it, with elections coming up, then getting onto the parties, making as much noise, getting it included on the manifesto is huge because if you look sometimes on, on, on parties manifestos it's the people that can make the most noise they start the, the, the looking at their, their manifestos and i think again around pr um start hammering into the newspapers the, 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 the media they will take notice if there's lots going in if there's not lots going in they won't and then what tends to happen is you go with the people that have supported you through your manifesto 
for, for a lot of cases like this, you know, they can, they can, there's a lot of areas don't vote. Um, I vote very, the turnover is very small from areas. And if you look at those areas, they're the areas that have been designated, again, I don't think, but, but, but they're designated as problematic areas and they don't. And if you're not voting, and I think as well, if we could get the, the, the age limit down to 16, I, I think you'd have a lot more power in that. Um, but there's, you know, the areas designated disadvantaged tend not to turn out in the same numbers as more affluent areas. Uh, uh, and they're probably, the, not, not all the time, but they're probably the areas most in need of all these and the services and the services aren't there. And I think, you know, supporting, um, election registration, support, getting people to turn out, getting people to see they have a, a say in this, uh, small victories. And, and I think that's the way to, to, to move that on as well. And that, you know, I, I do think, again, I go back to the Children's Rights Alliance, and I think, I think, you know, getting out there and getting into manifestos and things like that, that's a great vehicle for doing that because you, you, you have a power behind you and you have a lot of different groups in a lot of different areas and they're spread right throughout the country. I think that's what you, you're going to need. You're going to need people shouting and the love. Uh, thank you. If we have nobody else who wants to add anything, I think we can move on to our final question, which is once again for the entire panel. Where do you see children's rights play a role in the family courts in cases of family separation? Yeah, um, let's start start on that one. I mean, the, the position in, in principle uh, under our constitution and under the relevant legislation is that in any such cases, it, it, it's, it's stipulated that the best interest of the child is the first and paramount consideration for the court. Uh, so that's, the, that's your starting point. Uh, but in terms of realizing that aspiration, uh, there are there are things that need to be done to bring that more more to the center of, of those kinds of decisions. Um, so, for example, it's it's well recognized, and you know, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has emphasized this point that you can't properly make an assessment of a child's best interests without properly hearing from the child what their views are on the on the the issue being determined, uh, and even though, again, this is in, in the constitutional amendment, part of the constitutional amendment was saying that the views of children should always be heard wherever children are capable of forming those views in, in court proceedings like that. But the actual implementation of that in practice has been problematic, uh, partly due to, to legal issues and partly due to resourcing. And so when it comes to it in cases like this, the extent to which the views of children are properly considered is, is variable, shall we say, at the very least. Uh, and there will be a lot of cases where, where what the constitution says in theory isn't reflected by the, the reality. So, uh, so if you want to, to make children's best interest more central in, in family law proceedings, uh, we do need to work on a number of kind of systemic issues that will, will help to make that work more effectively. The family courts project, which is I, I didn't mention it earlier on, but one of the positive things happening right now, there's a big project happening in government to reform the courts and to establish specialist family courts uh, with specially trained judges uh, who would have interdisciplinary training on a range of issues around children's rights. And that's a really, really positive development. It's the right direction for our, our courthouse in Cork. Again, that, that issue of bringing in child-friendly facilities in the courts, which would be more suitable to actually bringing children in to participate in the proceedings is all part of that project. Um, so that is, you know, it, it's really good to see that. Uh, it's needed, uh, and, and you know there are there are points of detail I won't get into, but the, but there's a lot of work going on and submissions going in to try and influence that process to make sure that all the right ingredients are are in the mix uh, to make family proceedings more child centred and to to create that system and those facilities that will facilitate uh, children being at the centre of those proceedings uh, in a way that they they aren't at the moment. Uh, it's certainly not as good as it needs to be right now. Um, I might I might come in there just to follow on from Connor. I mean, as, as Connor said, you know, there is a lot of reform taking place in this area, and it's 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 really welcome. 
But at the same time, I mean, on, on, a, on an ongoing basis, uh, we in the Children's Rights Alliance are seeing very serious uh, children's rights issues playing out in the court system. Um, I mean, they are absolutely ill-equipped for dealing with these types of cases. Uh, we have a we have a new uh, Children and Family Relationships Act, which you know has some top class uh, sections in it, uh, particularly around um, a, a very good definition of the best interests of the child. But the judges themselves are ill-equipped often to interpret interpret that legislation. Um, at the moment, um, uh, parents have to pay to have their vo the voice of their child heard in cases. So if you have a significant portion of our population, they're either in poverty or at risk of poverty, how are they going to have to have the money to pay for that kind of report to be made to the, to the court? And that's many years after we had a referendum that says we were going to introduce legislation on this basis. Um, and it is concerning that when the state has had a chance to, let's say, regulate uh, the voice of the child, particularly in childcare proceedings, that's where children are um, potentially going to be taken into the childcare system or some intervention is going to be made. Um, we've looked at actually restricting uh, what that representation for children might, might actually look like. So at the moment, you know, lots of different things are happening across the country, but some of those advocates in court are actually litigating on behalf of children um, and making sure that their rights are upheld. Uh, and when we went to legislate in this space, uh, what the, really the goal was to try and restrict what those get, what those they're called guardian ad litem were, were, were going to do, um, and there's other really serious things happening. Like we've got a lot of cases coming through our individual, our, our um, our helpline, and we we force them on to, to legal advice where um, judges have made decisions around access. Uh, and this is particularly in domestic violence cases. We had a case not too uh, not too long ago where um, the, the 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 partner had actually been imprisoned and convicted and imprisoned for violence against um, his partner. I hadn't been in contact for about three years and then was looking for access many years later. So the judge decided yes, this partner should have access. Um, and but they had had to be supervised access. So uh, the judge decided that this independent company or consultant would be responsible for providing access. Um, and this mother had to hand over her child. This is not this, this is happening all over the country, by the way, to this person who hadn't been vetted, didn't seem to have it, had not been regulated by anyone to go off and have supervised access uh, with the partner. I mean, those kind of cases are really common, unfortunately, in the family court system. And what my concern is, until when we're doing reform in this area, I think the government is absolutely going in the right direction in terms of reform. But I am concerned that it's going to take too long and that many children and young people will be harmed because of the failure to reform the family court system. I mean, it's been on the cards for more than 20 years we've been talking about this and we still haven't done it. Um, and I think it's one of the things we absolutely have to prioritise is how children and young people are dealt with in these types of family cases. I might just come in um, after Tanya. Um, I, that was my, my, my starting point was going to say we are decades behind other countries in this space. Absolutely decades. Um, so it cannot happen fast enough. At the same time, the longer it goes on, the more I think uh, that actually our system is simply not suited to having children anywhere near court proceedings. And uh, while we can spend a lot of time and do need to spend all the, all the time and energy and expertise getting this right, we have got to back up. Uh, we've got to provide information and advocacy and support for children who are going through these um, situations in terms of, of uh, parental separation and other family, family difficulties. We've got to provide information and support and advocacy to children. We've got to help parents help their children through these situations. And we've got, we've got to have, have mediation that enables children needs to be part of that process, depending on their, their age and understanding, or to be um, separately supported. I mean, that this is, um, you know, the, the, the numbers of cases that get to court in any event are going to be the complex, difficult, really challenging cases. So we've got to really put the, uh, the support, the information, the advice and the advocacy in earlier to support adults to support children through the process and guide and uh, families themselves as to how best to look after children's interests in these kinds of situations. Uh, and yes, absolutely, we need to get the courts right and to do all that Connor and Tanya are talking about. Um, but given the time frame, the child friendly justice guidelines themselves are from 2010. I mean, 
they weren't hard groundbreaking when they were introduced. I mean, that's 11 years ago. It's, you know, so we, <laughs> this is one of those ones where I find myself talking like, oh, I'm getting very cross. <laughs> I look, I, I, I'm going to kind of move away from, from, from going near that question because uh, I, I know Rachel is waiting to finish up, but there's a couple of things I'd like to say about the four panelists and, and I think to bring a bit of, um, not to, 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 to say everything negative, but, but I think there, there, there's amazing positives. I, I think, you know, a, if you look at, you know, they, there can be wins. And, and I, I, I go back first to the Children's Rights Alliance in, in relation to the, the Poverty 2020. That, that campaign it was very, very effective and it did impact on people. And I think one of the reasons it did was that young people got a voice in that and, and were, were in the media. And I think young people are, are very good at showing this, but also professionals and parents got involved as well. And I think it was very good. I think if you look at the ombudsman, I think um, now, now he was in the office at the time, but I think it, it was true there that that um, the big thing started on, on, on St. Pat's and then it it, it did move. Um, and I think, you know, again, another big victory that looked for years that we were never going to, to get there and you're gone from a, a, a youth jail to a youth detention centre, which is now run by, by care workers as opposed to the prison guards um, in, in relation to the, 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 the special record for children. I, I think there's a, there is a case there for, for and I've seen Connor do this already in the short term in there, in that, you know, he, he does point out the flaws and he, he is very out there in doing that. And I think, again, that's hugely important. And, and I must say for you know, for, for me here, one of, one of the things that I've seen over time is how important it is, even at the local level, for instance, judges who aren't trained in in, um, in juvenile justice, uh, which seems a bit, <laughs> seems a bit out there. Um, but when, and it's happened, and I think Ursula was responsible for this and, and some of the other people in the system law, of taking young people from here and, and bringing them to, to Dublin and getting to speak to the legal profession, not in a court situation, but telling them how they were and what it meant for them. And I think the effect that it had on people, um, it really brought it home. And I've seen that as well, you know, I, we've taken young people to the European Parliament or to Europe, uh, to the UN. And when the young people speak, and speak so eloquently about their what's gone on in their lives. It, it does have a huge impact. And I think the more of that that's done, I mean, the young people blow me away that, you know, we don't tell them what to write and, and other Ursula and, and any of the people we've ever worked with, don't tell them what to write. And sometimes I'm kind of saying, saying to them, look, do you need to say all of that? And you find that they do. And, and a lot of it is that they want to do it so that other young people will not fall into where they were. Uh, and for me, that's, that was eye-opening. Um, and also the impact it can have. Children's voices on children's issues have a lot more impact than adults speaking about them. And, and, and I'm convinced of that. And if it's done in a proper participatory way, all of the people that are on the panel here have had huge successes in this. And, and I think, you know, we should remember that. It, it is small steps. Um, sometimes for me, I think this is where I go negative, it's too slow. But, you know, you're empowering young people as we go. And, and I think that's hugely, hugely important because we cannot lose the fact that young people should be able to advocate for themselves um, with us in a very, very supporting role. And I want to thank everyone on the panel for, for that. Rich is going to kill me. She's supposed to be finishing up, so I'm going to do that. Yeah, well, it's a good excuse now, isn't it, to say like that John stepped on a lot of my material there. Um, and I just want to keep it short because I'm conscious of people's time. But I suppose very hard to I attempt to summarize. It's it's so nuanced a conversation, and the issues are so complex that um it's difficult to do that. But I suppose 
the overriding point for me, which was a bit new today, was was really looking at this notion of, um, you know, we know what's happening at government policy level. You know, there's been some progress, lots of work left to do. But what we probably don't often look at is that kind of understanding in our homes and our schools and our doorsteps. What do people actually mean when they talk about children's rights? You know, um, and I think as Tanya and I alluded to some of the answers you might get if you went and surveyed the general public would probably surprise you. So I suppose on behalf of the Cork Life Centre, I could say that we really genuinely have been very fortunate um, and that everyone, and Don's kind of touched on this on this panel, has actually provided us with education opportunities as staff, our young people, um, to actually learn what, what children's rights really are. Um, and it means an awful lot um, for you know people of your caliber to be saying that, that we are committed to that as a service. And indeed we are, but we have an awful lot left to learn, you know, like anyone else. And I suppose, I think the conversation kept coming back to education and it was dominated by education, which is only right and true. And I suppose if I look ahead to the next 20 years, I'd love to be in a position where young people are at the fore of teaching us about children's rights, because from the age of three, four, five, they've been learning about them. And it's it's a standardized part of their curriculum and their lives and and, and the way we speak. Um, so that's a big ask, but I think that's that's how we will see the the, the most impact. And I suppose I just want to thank everybody, you know, for being so generous with, with their time um, and to say that this is closing what has been really a very, very special week with us. I think every panelist that we had, um, people were saying, how did you put together panels like that? And it was it was such a lovely position to be able to say, well, we know them, you know, they they were friends. They've always supported our work and, um, you know, we feel very fortunate. Thanks, everyone. And we're not even going to get a cup of tea, like. You can have a drop of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I always mean that in Cork, are they? <laughs> <laughs>